The self alone is. Nothing else ever is. This is the simple truth. For the Maharshi's grace and the continuous revelation of that truth, we can never be too thankful. If you have doubts regarding the reality, whichever is, or if through imagination you assume the unreal to be real, then inquire within yourself, who am I? And thus know the truth. When you know reality or the truth, it is reality that comprehends reality. For there is no second. There is only one self. It is the ever-existent. There is no other. There is, therefore, in truth, no one in bondage and no bondage. No one aspiring to liberation and no separate state of liberation. Nor is there a liberated individual. Just the self of the nature of a limital being, consciousness, bliss, alone is. Again, for his grace in the continuous revelation of that silent truth, we can never be too thankful. And again, if there is a doubt as to what is real or who you are, then inquire to know who you are. And if at any point you have a question and you wish to ask, or you want to relate your own experience, please feel free to speak or to ask. Uh, Friday night, <clears throat> um, I was uh, sort of berating myself about trying to objectivize the self. Um, and assuming that I had to stop that. Um, afterwards, when we were downstairs, if I remember correctly, you indicated that vibe and you said, even objectivized, by which I understood, thinking it over since, uh, that there is uh, there's, there's no alternative. <clears throat> not only the self cannot be objectivized, but nothing can be objectivized. So I was just, I, I came to the conclusion that you meant that if something appears objectivized, it only appears that way. And that, uh, that's what we call, can call Maya. But then actually, there's nothing, there's no alternative, as you just indicated. And uh, I'm, tr I'm trying to get to the that. <coughs> and I want to make sure I'm on the right, going in the right direction. So the non-duality does not have an alternative. It is not one among many. It is that which alone exists. It can never be a known or unknown object. If you imagine objectivity, 
that objectivity is still only that. That misperceived through delusion. Yet the delusion itself does not have a separate existence. To resolve the non-existent maya, for that is what maya is, that which is not. Find out for whom it is. It is evident that your being is non-objective. If there arises I, the notion of existing as an individual of some kind, then there will be imagined an object, and the imagined object will always correspond in kind to the definitions superimposed upon the individual who himself does not actually exist. Therefore, follow the Maharshi's advice. For whom is this? Who am I? Your advice was to follow the direction of who could, who could be in, who could be limited or bound. If we inquire who is bound, we find no bound individual at all, just Brahman, just the self. It is one self. You don't have another kind of self. We can never be too thankful. As Sri Bhagavan has pointed out, our gratitude consists in steady abidance in that as that itself. When we say abidance, what is meant is an absence of misidentification so that the whole sense of your identity is in the self and not with what is not the self, such as your body, your mind, or any object of the world. Where identity is posited, so are reality and happiness. When your knowledge of happiness, the source of happiness, what it is, is steadily inward, when your knowledge of what is real is not being cast out on what is unreal, I see to keep on. and when your sense of identity is what the I truly is and not what one assumes it to be, such is said to be abidance. Um, so as to, to keep on the, the knowledge of that, the, the... A steady inquiry? Yes. A steady, continuous, deep inquiry? To abide by. Becomes steady abidance. Okay. The same knowledge that is in itself abidance is the knowledge active or dynamically in motion, so to speak, in inquiry. The end appears as the means. Okay, because it has no, uh, it is always. It is one knowledge. Okay, so it goes now, it goes now into delusion, to if you are abiding and, and following the correct. If you inquire yeah, but then. within yourself to know who you are, you cut the very root of illusion or delusion. Yes, now. Simultaneous with the disappearance of ignorance is the revelation of true knowledge. Just as if we 
take something like the cloth and I cover this piece of wood, the removal of the cloth and the revelation of the wood are simultaneous. There's no delay because the wood was always there, just covered as the substrate. In a similar way, your nature, the self, is eternal. The sign of reality is that it is without beginning or end, and therefore it is unchanging. It is always there, perfectly so. The inquiry simply removes the illusion, the imagination, the cloth, and the analogy. Okay. Claire? It's a very good analogy. It's a magic show. <laughs> 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 it is? All right, it's a magic show. <laughs> Find out who the magician is. <laughs> um, what if I find out I'm the, the rapid? I could be all. <laughs> I am all. <laughs> if you find out you're the rabbit, then it is your duty to disappear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, proceeded to get sick to her stomach, had to go out, and was actually nauseated on the way home. She was still interested in the teaching, and we had given her books that she read like a novel and just didn't get anything out of it. But every time she came to visit, um, the energy that we had, she recognized and wanted. So here she was, breaking her hip, and uh, not having insurance, and this and that, she came to, she's right now in her hour home, kind of missing. Uh, I said to her, you have to understand that Chris and I are reading from spiritual texts every morning, and that's what we just do. You uh, are welcome to join us, you're welcome if you don't. And she chose to join us. Now, in a short time, a little over two weeks, that she has been with us, she so entrenched herself in the teaching that, she's very hard too, that in, in a short period of time, she really got what it took me five years to get. And uh, the fact that she lost her job, the fact that she has no health insurance, the fact that her dog is sick, sort of made it, with the teaching, made those stories fall away. And uh, she's so entrenched in the teaching that the stories didn't come up. And for that, she is so grateful. So what it is, is that Maharshi's teaching go through you, go through us, and go through everything that is being touched. What a blessing. What a blessing. And some are not open, and some are do, as I was. I was not open for a long time, and then all of a sudden, grace just had a way of making itself known, and uh, my cup of thoughts 
got more empty, and the heart was allowed to show. So being poured into silence more and more, that uh, although she is in our home, we don't talk much. And I warned her of that. I said, so it's not about you, it's about me, that uh, uh, there's just no story out there. It's just not true. It's just not true. It's not who we are. And so she even picked up that orange book that you had given to us, the 40 verses. And I see her close her eyes, and the book is on her chest, and she's contemplating this. <laughs> How wonderful. Here is something to observe for yourself. What is it actually that brings about depth of knowledge or experience? Is it the lapse of time? No. What actually are the factors that cause you to go deep? The basic is self-inquiry because Whenever a thought comes up and I do self inquiry, it just, and Karen has that same experience, she said, everything becomes quiet. And from that depth, self inquiry absolutely has a way of erasing everything that the mind, the ego may think it is. So the body goes away, the ego goes away, the daily life goes away, and there's just nothing left, of which I was totally scared in the beginning. And something is left. <laughs> there's, there's, not even, there's not even a happy feeling left. Even, even that isn't there and it doesn't stay. You know, the passion of life. But if it doesn't scare you, as you say, there must be a you that Someone is left. Who's not scared? <laughs> I got it. Consider also how the discrimination inherent in inquiry is propelled by the intensity of one's desire for liberation, the purposefulness that one has, the earnestness with which one pursues. That naturally manifests as the perseverance or intensity with which one practices. Consider also how when discrimination manifests as detachment from the unreal, it no longer draws you out. All these fuse together in practice. And as you said before so many times, the desire for liberation, the desire to know the world is of such importance because then Pramana falls away. <laughs> and I've been so upset about just not remembering to do self-inquiry. There was always someone who was upset about not doing self-inquiry. Hmm. It'd be better just to inquire. <laughs> <laughs> 
the measurements, the distinctions, the adventures of the person have the same degree of reality or unreality as the person herself. The adventures of a dream character have the same degree of reality as the dream character herself. When we wake up, how do we regard the dream character that we thought we were and the dream activities and the dream time, be it two weeks or five years? All of that becomes insignificant because it has no reality. The one thing that was invisible in the dream was the one thing that composed it all, but it was not involved in it. That is your own consciousness. It is now the same. It also helps a great deal to have the CDs in our home. I mean, Chris buys them all, but the, <laughs> but the ones that uh, the dialogue between between well, I have to say, you and me. <laughs> um, Chris oftentimes uh, uh, prints them out, and I have them in writing. I listen to them over and over and over, because although there is understanding, there's also, by experience, also a point that I thought I understood but didn't. And listening to it several times, there is another Oh my goodness, why didn't I hear that one before? That's why it's customarily recommended that you listen, and listening should be ongoing. Reflect, <clears throat> deeply meditate, and thus be absorbed. So I've been thinking about kind of our discussion on Friday night, you know, in particular, I guess this whole attachment to, um, I don't know, somehow work or job, and the fact that we were discussing something very high, moral for this body, this, etc. But all this stuff, a job, obviously a body has a job. But it's, but you know, to identify with that, it's on such a kind of grosser level. How do you identify with the body? It is not you, so how do you identify with it? Through imagination. 
then the association with its characteristics and activities are likewise just imagination. When you do something through imagination, is it real? <laughs> no, because it's definitely not, it didn't create a mark. So in what way can you say you're attached? Well, actually, even during the whole thing, you know, the fact that I was driving around in circles, you know, trying to get to... The fate of everyone in samsara. I mean, in a certain sense, I thought, oh my God, I mean, this is, you know, this is kind of almost hilarious, right? Because here I am driving around in circles. At least she gave credit where it's due. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. My God. Oh my God. <laughs> In a certain sense, I guess there's no uh, uh, sort of Pravda karma at that point, I guess, sort of. Were you going in circles? Hmm. No. Did your happiness depend on it? I, I would prefer that I realized, you know, that the whole intersection was... So it wasn't really dependent, although it seemed it would have been nicer. There would have been a preference there. Your ability to discern what is preferred or what not is not necessarily an attachment. It's when you confound your happiness that causes the suffering. Did you suffer? Most of the time I'd say it wasn't suffering. I was just, could hardly believe the buildings. It was so funny, I was driving down the road that I thought it was, looking at these buildings going, how in the heck could they change the buildings? <laughs> you know, because it was so confusing. It was really... You thought they actually changed the buildings? No, I didn't really <laughs> think that. But I mean, I, I was really puzzled, like, how, you know. But all the roads have changed. So that was the confusing part. <laughs> Confused about the directions, or they changed all the buildings and roads since you were there, either one. But did you suffer as a consequence? Did you lose your happiness? I think about the third wrong turn. You know, and usually every wrong turn accounted for like 10 minutes of traffic, because you know, you end up on this freeway that's just jam packed full of cars. So it became a little, but even then it wasn't that bad. I mean, it's sort of like, oh my God, not on this freeway again <laughs> for the fifth time. Did you suffer? Uh, Did you believe yourself to be the body in the car going around in circles? I wasn't, I was just trying to think how I think I'm going to get there. I wasn't really so concerned with anything else. There were thoughts about that. Where were you in the whole experience? See, that's, I wasn't aware of that, where I was. I mean, that was... What do you mean? Do you mean you were not thinking about it? That's right. Is thinking knowledge? No. <laughs> then whether you thought about it or not is rather insignificant. You might prefer to think about it. <laughs> but absence of that thought does not mean absence of knowledge.
you may prefer to arrive at the destination you were intending rather than taking a tour of the same few blocks again and again. But that doesn't necessarily mean attachment. You must be free of attachment and must be free of ignorance. To be free of the attachment, to be free of the ignorance, you should discern what constitutes it and then inquire. And it's sort of like your description today, you know, that in your discussions, without that ignorance, it seems like things are very clear. You know, kind of like space-like. Is the state of self-knowledge really a state? Is it a condition of mind? Is it like waking, dreaming, or deep sleep? Well, I, I definitely sort of believe, I mean, I should say that it is, but because I invest energy in our reality into my thoughts, then that occurs. So you must lend the reality to your thoughts without which they don't even have a semblance or an appearance of reality. This tells you something. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Not even a semblance. Then in truth, there's no such thing as thought. They have never been born, nor this world for that matter. Can you just repeat that? I don't understand the connection. Because there's no semblance of reality, obviously. Because reality... If they have no reality except that which is imagined, that is, if they have no existence except that which is lent to them, then they are, in themselves, non-existent. They have not been born. They have not been created. They have not come to be. If thought hasn't come to be, the world also is likewise. The experience of the world is utterly dependent on the state of mind. But you, of the nature of being consciousness, are not in or of a state of mind. So this, the fact that there is a change of state, I mean, because if I just look at if I look at my state now, that's different, right? That's not... In what way different? If that... Because it doesn't, it's going to be harder to comprehend illusion that exists, you know, because it just seems, things seem clearer. Did your existence become clearer? Did your existence become clouded? Or 
or is there interesting because I definitely believe that. So, what is the nature of the one who believes it? If the self is real, it ever is just as it is. If you then say, it's clear, it's clouded, or I'm closer or farther away, further away from it. Who is this other one? <laughs> when you say, I believe, what is the I? Which is the source of your belief. Question it now. To say it is assumed to be something when it itself is the one who assumes <laughs> is absurd. Well, I was questioning it, and I could see any location. So I was kind of investigating this, because when you asked me, I said, okay, well, let's just find out. And if I look and say, okay, what is the essence of me? It seems uh, very space-like. You couldn't put a finger on it as a definition of somebody to have something as in my statement. So then, like space, it does not actually become enclosed within anything else, does it? Rather, it pervades even that something else is both inside and outside and has no form of its own. There are no corners in space. If you imagine there's a corner, you have only to dive into the corner to see what actually makes up the corner. The more you dive into it, the smaller the corner becomes. Likewise, dissolving that. It's nothing more than a notion. Imagination. Just like that with the ego and the self. If you imagine the self to be individualized as an ego, inquire as to what that I is. Its I-ness or egoity vanishes. The space-like, the abiding reality remains. That's of the nature of utmost clarity, always. It never went around in a circle, <laughs> whether it be on the highway or in the samsara. <laughs> For that which was never bound, the reality of liberation is certain. Listening to your dialogue with Eric, I started to question uh, this whole notion of suffering and what is it and do I even have the capacity to actually suffer? When I try to actually get a hold of what the essence of suffering is, it's just as imagined as the one who dreams that he's suffering. And then if I try to find, can I actually suffer 
it's almost like asking myself the question, can I change my existence? Can I turn into something else? And it's pretty clear there's no way that they, that, that can be done. There's no, there's not something that does that. then all kinds of suffering are rather needless, aren't they? Yeah, I don't think... Trying to find maybe some kind of suffering that's necessary? No. body is subject to pleasures and pains. Uh, okay. If we think we are the body, we suffer within those pleasures and pains. That is, our experience becomes limited, our own bliss is veiled. If we know we are not the body, then we don't suffer even if there be pain. Oh, so the self didn't suffer, just the body. Right. Um, and that's what you're saying, that it's... So then, if you know you're not the body, and are detached from his pleasures and pains. You don't suffer, you don't have grief, you don't sorrow. So it's all been conditioned of not thinking of ourselves as the body. Of thinking oneself to be the body, and then therefore contained within or imprisoned within the experiences of the body. So that what happens to the body, you then say, happens to you. But it's not true. When we see it's not true, we realize the sufferings have been needless. We were sorrowing over something that didn't require any grief. We were free the entire time. So the pain is not suffering. That's right. So therefore it's not required. <laughs> Thank you, Master. Um, as I listen to your instruction and the dialogues, what comes to my mind, and I don't know if it's um, just a partially expedient way I have developed to look at things, but it seems that if I'm discriminating between the real and the unreal and where happiness derives and where it doesn't. I often find myself leaving some little corner exempt. It might be that, oh, but I can still be disappointed if the body feels unwell or tired or if the job doesn't go well or if this adventure takes this course. And for, sometimes it even reminds me of the disappointment in the, the story I think the Maharshi also mentions of uh, Ostrovaka and Janaka, where Janaka has this disappointment that the teaching hasn't taken explicit verbal form as he expected. And whatever it is, it seems that the inquiry can sometimes come back as grace in the recognition, no, that too, neti neti, that too is not exempt. 
Um, it isn't that there is no individual, but there is a job, or there's no individual, but there is a pain in the body. There's no individual, but there's a, an adventure that is taking a disappointing course. No, those two, if you've given it all to the guru, if you've given it all to the self, if, if all you want is the self, that goes too. Nothing is exempt, it's sometimes the way. What would you want to exempt? No, I, I don't think I want to exempt anything, but I find myself exempting things, you know. <laughs> Why? If you choose not to examine something, if you choose not to negate something as being real, when you actually have some intuition or some knowledge that truth is otherwise, why? In some strange way, I, I hadn't wanted to up until the point where I, I let it go. So I must be um, still seeking or, or think I'm enjoying some sense of identity, reality, or happiness in it, whatever that exempted area is. Will you negate something as being unreal if you think your happiness is connected to it? That would cause a conflict. I would not want to negate You'd have a conflict of interest. <laughs> <laughs> My interest would be in the happiness, right? So there's really not much mystery to this exemption. No, it's not a mystery. It just that's the way it seems to appear sometimes that that's what the that's what the the inquiry can can serve for at that point is is um, putting it all up against the absolute and seeing what stands uh, the test of reality. Yes, and so whatever you say you're bound by, that you appear to be bound by. And that which you wish to be free of, you do indeed become free of. Look who the determination rests with. There is nothing obstructing the realization of the Absolute. But there appear to be those obstacles or those delays according to what you hold fast as being your happiness or, or as you mentioned, being real and being your identity. But if you are convinced for some bizarre reason that your happiness depends on a certain idea or a certain object. You won't examine it, will you? No, you'll protect it uh, from that examination in a way. Because you, because you know how fragile it is, that merely by looking at it, it will be destroyed. <laughs> now, who is it who, by his mere glance, can destroy things? <laughs> <laughs> That Shiva is indwelling. That indwelling Shiva is also the highest bliss. It is the good. When, when you mentioned the phrase, you bore it in question, the, is it the uh, lapse of time? That's when I thought of the Ostravaka story because whenever it works right, the shift in knowledge is as quick as putting down a foot in the stirrup. It's just, if you see it for what it is, it takes no time. It takes no time because the knowledge, just like the existence itself, is already existent. Hence the Maharshi says, what is not eternal is not worth seeking. So we are not looking for a knowledge or an existence that is not yet or needs to ripen or any other such thing. What you're seeking to know, to realize, as if it were unreal to be made more real, is actually the reality itself. Now you know how fragile the false is. If you see the false as false, if you see ignorance as ignorance, it is destroyed right then and there. Only the destructible, obviously, is destroyed. 
the indestructible, which is the immutable, is never destroyed. In the indestructible lies your immortality. In the immutable lies your peace. Within lies your happiness. What is within is the self. There is your happiness, your peace, the unchanging absolute. If we really know this, the neti neti referred to earlier by you applies to everything else. Then you don't hesitate to examine, to inquire, because you know in doing so, you will always realize that which is happiest. then there are no exemptions or exceptions. It seems sometimes the as an expedient teaching of noticing the transiency, if only at first, helps because if you at least notice the transiency in something, that immediately takes some of the attractiveness out of it. Yes, again, it's an intuition of your own nature. You yearn for that which endures because of your own everlasting nature. You attach yourself to something in the name of happiness because you know that happiness is your nature. Only that happiness is realized by non-attachment, by an absence of ignorance. It's a rather simple thing. Ranchikhani vitradat swayam bho Tasmat parang pashyadi nantaratman Kaschid diraha pratyagatma namiksha Avritya jakshur amrtatva michan The self-existent Lord destroyed the outgoing senses. Therefore, one sees the outer things and not the inner self. A rare discriminating man desiring immortality turns his eyes away and then sees the indwelling self. Parajaha kaman anuyanti balaha te mrityuryanti vidatasya pasham athadira amrtattam viditva dhruvamadruveshvaha na prarthayante the unintelligent people follow the external desires. They get entangled in the snares of the widespread death. Therefore, the discriminating people, having known what true immortality is in the midst of impermanent things, do not pray for anything here. Yena rupam rasam gantham shabdan sparshan dunan Ete neva vijana di Kimatra parishishate Edadvaitata. What remains here, unknowable to this self, through which very self people perceive color, taste, smell, sound, touch, and sexual pleasures? This is that self asked for by Nachiketa. Swapnantam jakaridantam chobho yena nupashyati mahantam vibhumatmanam matvadhiro na shochati. 
having realized that great and all-pervading self through which a man perceives the objects in both the sleep and the waking states, a wise man does not grieve. Yadeve hatta mutra, yada mutra tadan biha, murtyo ho samurtyo map noti, ya ihana ne bapashati. What indeed is here is there. What is there is here likewise. He who sees as though there is a difference here goes from death to death. Vanase Vedam Aptavyam Neha Nana Stikinchana Mrityo Hasamrtyam Gachati Ya Ihana Neva Pashati. This is to be attained through the mind. There is no diversity whatsoever. He who sees as though there is a difference here goes from death to death. Yathotakam shutthe shuttham asiktam tadrake vabhavati evam munir vijanata atma bhavati gautama O Gautama, as pure water poured on pure water becomes verily the same, so also does become the self of the man of knowledge who is given to deliberation on the self. 